Thanks for watching the Meridian Friends Church sermons here on YouTube. You can also listen to a podcast version of the sermons on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts if you ever need to listen on the go. For more information about our church, you can head over to www.meridianfriends.org or check us out on Facebook by searching Meridian Friends. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the sermon. I want to invite you to turn with the Bible to Matthew 6 as we dismiss the children for Children's Church. So glad to have you worship with us uh, to this point in the service. And blessings on you as you study and have some fun. That's what we're going to do too. We're going to have some fun as well as we study, correct? Matthew chapter 6. I am continuing a series of messages on the greatest sermon ever preached. And that's Jesus' own sermon called Often the Sermon on the Mount. What you might remember as we've been talking about this for a little while is that Matthew had a specific goal in writing his gospel. It's different than the goal that Luke had. Luke was to set out an orderly account of the events of Jesus. That's what he says he wrote for. We know that John is different. He wrote these things that you might believe. So in other words, he's evangelizing a group of people, and and we know that he's mostly appealing to uh, Greek and non-Jewish audiences, but Matthew's different. Matthew is writing his gospel, and his hearers are those who have a Jewish background, just like Jesus and just like his disciples. They have a Jewish background, yet, and even though they're religious, they understand the Old Testament, yet they don't get it. They don't understand that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And so Matthew's going out of his way to give all kinds of reference to the law, to the Old Testament, to help us believe and to help us understand, and also to help us see how incredibly desperate we are without Jesus Christ. And I think that's really important for us to think about as we go to read this. In fact, I found something from George Whitfield, a famous preacher, who said something that might seem kind of surprising to you. I'm going to quote him. Before you can speak peace in your own heart, You must not only be made sick of your original and your actual sin, but you must also be made sick of your righteousness, of all of your duties and performances. There must be a deep conviction before you that can be brought out of your self-righteousness. It's the last idol, he says, to be taken out of your heart. Would you stand with me as you're able? And I want to invite you to hear what Jesus had to say get this, to religious folks like us. Be careful, enough said, not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, 
your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. May we live for an audience of one and one alone. Amen? Amen. God bless the reading of his word, and you may be seated. I actually recently preached from Matthew 6, and as I came to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, that didn't surprise me a bit, because this is one of my favorite chapters There is so much here that consistently speaks to my condition, that consistently wakes me up and makes me think. It encourages me. I haven't read the end of the chapter yet. I will to close the sermon. And it challenges me deeply. And I want to start with that challenge. But as I was preparing for this message this week, there's one portion of Scripture that just stood out to me Oh, and that too. (laughs) There's one person that just stood out to me. It's verse 24 that I hadn't noticed before as a theme that runs across this entire chapter. And and I want to allow Jesus' comment, the fact, he says, that no one can serve two masters as a controlling comment for the rest of this chapter. And invite you to reread Matthew 6 differently, perhaps, than you've ever read it before. And I want to show you why I feel like this is a theme that runs through this whole thing. To frame it and to help us to see that, I think that Jesus' words here in Matthew 6 evoke three challenging questions for religious folks like you and me. Who, And by the way, I told you why Matthew wrote all this. And the problem with that is, is that... It's so dangerous for us to be religious people, and yet as a pastor, I want you to be religious people. <laughs> I'm by nature, I know others are not by personality, but, but I'm by nature not one who questions everything and, and has to have a reason for everything. I, I like following the rules, and, and I like the rules. I know that not everybody's that way. And so in a way, I just have a lot of empathy for the Pharisees and scribes that Jesus is describing. I just want you to know that as I start off. And so this chapter consistently challenges me. And Jesus says, Ken Redford, you cannot serve two masters. And I wonder if you would hear Jesus' voice saying that in your heart today. For me, this provokes three different questions around a few different topics that Jesus offers here. And I'm asking the overall question, as I think Jesus does, which master do you serve? He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. And then he talks about the pillars of Jewish righteousness with regard to giving and prayer and fasting. And in other words, if you did anything as a religious person, you did these three things and everybody knew it. Maybe today those, that list would look a little different. Maybe it would be going to Sunday school, tithing, and I don't know what they would be. But they would be kind of the outward things that everybody knows about and everybody can see. The question I think Jesus asks here is how much, and and I think he invites us to ask, how much do I rely on the applause of others in order for me to be willing to be faithful? How much do I need your notice? How much do I need your affirmation in order to be faithful to continue to practice what really ought to be a gift to God? Whether it's something like fasting whether it's something like giving, whether it's something like uh, serving others or praying. How much do I need you to notice before my heart is at rest? And you don't have to answer out loud, but is this as challenging to you as it is to me? Because the whole church setup (laughs) reinforces those who are outwardly beautiful in their faith, and yet none of us knows what's going on in the heart. A few years ago, I was privileged to visit 
Cairo, Egypt. And I got to go into the Egyptian Museum, and I got to see this entire wing that is devoted to you-know-who, King Tut. And the interesting thing about King Tut, when his grave was discovered in 1924 by Howard Carter, there were at least six layers. So in other words, when they first began to excavate this pyramid, and most of the pyramids had been pillaged over the years, all the gold had been stolen, but King Tut's wasn't stolen. That was the remarkable thing about this find. When they, when they got into this cavern where they found inside the pyramid King Tut's remains, what they actually found was this enormous sarcophagus, and it's on display in Egypt. It's huge. Inside of that coffin is, guess what? Another coffin. And that one's not just painted, but it's got gold in it. It's beautiful. And it's on display. But inside that coffin, once they carefully opened that coffin, they found the curse of the mummy. No, they didn't find that. <laughs> they found yet another coffin that was even more ornate and more beautiful until they got down to the layers of the coffin that he was actually in. And that's the one that you think of when you see the pictures of King Tut's tomb. It's the one that's solid gold. It's the smallest one. Solid gold gold and it's just an outline of his figure and then when they took that off they found a gold mask and that's the gold mask that you think of with the the scepters that have symbolism and etc etc that he was all powerful and everything else but at the end of the day what's ironic about this whole picture is that what they found with regard to the shiny outside gold was an inside leathery gross, dead corpse. And I think this is what Jesus is saying to his audience. Be really careful about being too impressed with what you see. And I think on the flip side, for those of us who need to be seen, and that's all of us, it's nice to get a thank you. It's, it's nice for somebody to empathize. It's important to be able to talk together about our feelings and so forth. I, I get it. But to what extent do we need the affirmation in order to be faithful? And, and Matthew pulls this out of Jesus' comments in such a way that I think the scribes and Pharisees cannot miss it. And I got to thinking, well, what would it be like to have a church full of scribes and Pharisees. For one thing, you would all be here every Sunday. And you would all be on time. And you would be early. You would all be tithing. Every available teaching spot for this fall would already be signed up for. I could go on and on and on down the list of what it would be like to have a church full of scribes and Pharisees. But then, wait a minute, I remember what would also be true is that most, if not all, according to what I read from what Jesus had to say to scribes and Pharisees, most, if not all, also would miss the heart of the gospel. They would miss intimacy with Jesus Christ. They would miss, in fact, the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 5, I elaborated on how Jesus is describing the law, and he's pulling out these six pieces of the law, and, and he's unpacking it, and he essentially says that your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees in Matthew 5.20. And we think, well, they were meticulous. We'd, we'd have to buy more chairs. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? And obviously what Jesus is saying, as you turn the page to Matthew 6, he hasn't changed subjects. He's still talking about the same thing. What he's saying is this is the kind of righteousness that we really need, a righteousness that comes from the inside out, not one that's dependent upon the outward shiny exterior that we all want people to applaud us for and to celebrate us for. Jesus said, be very, very careful. And so for me, it's a gut check. Every time I read these words, it's a gut check. How much 
Do I need your affirmation, your pat on the back, your good words, your eye contact, your attaboy? How much do I need that in order to be faithful? And obviously the danger in that is that sometimes faithfulness to Jesus is in direct opposition to the attaboy that you're going to get from the crowd. And nobody's life demonstrates this more clearly than the life of Christ. Sure, he was popular during a large portion of his ministry. But he wasn't popular at all when he told them the truth. And these are hard words. If this feels like a hard message, it is. By the way, and I think it is worth noting, Jesus' words were spoken to people who were faithful in their religious practice. So, in other words, right? Are you with me? You know where I'm going. These words were spoken to people who already are faithful. George Whitfield described these two conversions. We need to be disgusted with our own sin and apathy, and we need to be disgusted with our own self-righteousness. These are talking to two different crowds. We can't look at Jesus' words and say, well, I have a great heart even though I don't practice my religion, even though I don't give to people who need me to give to them. Even though I don't demonstrate outwardly my faith, at least I have a good heart, so I must be following what Jesus said. Do you get it? Okay, there's other parts of the Bible for that. <laughs> this is a specific message that addresses those who already are practicing, they're trying at great sacrifice to themselves to be faithful to God. Which master are you serving? The Sermon on the Mount all the way through addresses our motives and our heart. Why are we doing what we do? And Jesus said earlier in the Beatitudes, the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart. Those are the ones who are actually going to see God. Blessed are the hungry, those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for those are the ones that are going to be filled. And if those scribes and Pharisees weren't so put off that they walked away at that point in the sermon, they might have right here because they had specific practices around making sure that they were noticed, including painting their faces when they fasted. The word hypocrite is, of course, the word for actor, and they would paint their face so that the lines on the face could be more clearly seen without these nice spotlights so that they could see what expression they were trying to project to an audience. They were literally called out as people who were hiding behind a mask. Jesus said to them that, well, he said, be careful. He said to them that even though you look great on the outside, on the inside, you're decaying. And I wonder if for any of us, if we come to that point of just frustration and anger and, and disappointment because we've been faithful, I wonder if it's because in our humanness, we tend to serve the wrong master. We tend to look to the wrong place for that well done, good, and faithful servant. He's the one who's unseen. And could I add unheard? I know that biblically people hear God. And I've actually spoken with people who also have had that experience. And they'll tell you that they have heard God audibly, but, but could I add it in at least for me? Not just the one that I can't see, but the one that I can't hear, the one that I can't feel. Is it enough to know that, that we're faithful to Jesus in spite of what we see, in spite of what the results are? I remember reading something that Keith Green wrote many, many years ago. Do you guys remember Keith Green? Man, that guy could put lyrics together. His songs were so convicting. He was a Christian artist way back when, when I was a teenager and worried about fitting in and worried about all those things. And Keith Green said, so what? If you don't fit in, dare to be different. And I lived on those songs. I wanted to be different. I, I wanted my life to count for something. Years later, I was a pastor, and I read something that he wrote. Fast forward like 10 years only from Keith Green's popularity from the 80s to the 90s. And he went 
from sold out venues of thousands of people to small churches where there were lots of empty seats. And he wrote about how important it is to continue to be faithful regardless of what you see and what you experience. And his words were, crowds are fickle. Styles change. Time goes by. If we're living for the applause of others, we need to know that it comes and it goes. Jesus was mobbed in several instances in the Gospels in his year of popularity, year one of his ministry. But by the end, he was abandoned at a cross by even his own disciples. And this is his message for us. If you're busy and faithful and sacrificial and doing, I say, wonderful and why are you doing it? How much, do I repl- uh, how much do I rely on the applause of others? It's just a question. I can't answer it for you. But it's a question I consistently hear God asking me in my soul. Richard Foster has quite a convicting thing to say about all of this. And if you've never read Celebration of Discipline, wow. It's a challenging book. Richard Foster happens to be a Quaker. He happens to be a Quaker from Northwest Year to Meeting of Friends Church. He's a former pastor of Newburgh Friends Church. Nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service. He's a thick writer, but did you get that? Service is important. And nothing transforms the desires of the flesh. That's what I'm talking about here, our need for applause like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whirls or whines against service. Isn't that true? (laughs) The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. It will devise subtle, religiously acceptable means, like a Fitting it into a prayer request, maybe. (laughs) I'm going to be this busy. (laughs) Religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service rendered. If we stoutly refuse to give in to this lust of the flesh, we crucify it. In, In his book on celebration of the disciplines, he's talking about simple practical things that we can do to help us grow spiritually. And one spiritual discipline he's talking about is service, but not only that, but service where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, where the person who is served couldn't even know that you were the one who served that person. And, and there's a breaking of this, this lust that we have to be appreciated and recognized. Every time we crucify the flesh, we crucify our pride and our arrogance. Second question that I think Jesus offers as it just runs through the course of this chapter. I invite us to use this as reflection. Do I control my money, or does it control me? Is this a groaner topic? You've heard this question before, right? Are you in control of your material possessions, or do your material possessions make you a slave? We live in an era of unprecedented debt. And the Proverbs and wisdom and Scripture have a lot to say about finances, whether we like it or not. There's some like 2,500 verses on finances in the Bible. So if you want to run away from your finances because you love Jesus and you just want to get into God's Word, you might be surprised. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So, so he brings it up in the Sermon on the Mount of all things. And I forgot to read it. It goes like this in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust or vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. By the way, what are the riches that are um, stolen by moths and vermin? It's the excess. It's what we got stored up that we're not even paying attention to. They get into that stuff. Like old cars, you've heard how mice get in and build a nest in the motor and mess it all up. And where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And this is where Jesus breaks in and says that we are not actually capable of serving two masters. Okay. So if the righteousness, the self-righteousness thing doesn't get you, (laughs) what about this one? To what extent are we controlled by our need to find security, not so much in the pat on the back, but to find our security in our savings, to find security in our bank account, to find security in material things? Have we all lived long enough to know that just like crowds being fickle, (laughs) the market is fickle (laughs) as well. (laughs) Be faithful. I've been... Uh, I recently read a book about financial stewardship and faithfulness. And, and this is kind of the theme. Is you've got to control what you can control. And like I said, Jesus is talking to people who are giving. Well, Richard Foster has something to say about that too. Giving with glad and generous hearts has a way of routing out the, the old miser within us, the tough old miser. Even the poor need to know that they can give. What an important statement. This is the equity of the tithing thing. Is it's percentage-based. It's not amount-based. If you think it's just a cinch for people with thousands to tithe hundreds, um, think about it. <laughs> it's just as hard to tithe dimes on dollars for children. It's just as hard to tithe hundreds of thousands for millions. At some place, it's not about the amount. What Jesus is addressing is the heart, and he's saying, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Uh, Just the very act of letting go of money or some other treasure does something within us. It destroys the demon greed. Have you ever experienced that? I mean, money is so serious if you can't give it away. If you can't give it away, you need to ask why. Why? And a lot of times it's a management issue, but even in the midst of the management, well, I'm not going to go into financial stuff. But there it is. (laughs) It's a huge part of our spiritual life. It's a huge part of our disciplines. The old story is told of a girl on her way to Sunday school class just across the street from the church. Her mom had given her two quarters, one for the offering plate and one for ice cream on the way home. Well, the little girl stumbled, and one of the quarters went down the storm drain. And she immediately said, oh, no, there goes the Lord's quarter. (laughs) I think Jesus is challenging our heart and our attitude about our finances. And and I think that that's, that's a real and an important issue in this culture right now, because all of us, want to just compare ourselves to someone else's situation and say, I'm off the hook. This doesn't apply to me. I'm not so sure. I see lots of challenge in Matthew 6. Third question. And this is a summary. Jesus says, therefore. Do you notice that? This is a summary. As a summary, what do I worry about the most? I don't know. Maybe for you, it, it, it is the affirmation of others being recognized. Maybe for you, it is, I can't sleep at night because my money controls me, to be honest. It, I don't know what it is. There are many things that it could be. I want to invite you to write down a couple of points for reflection. These are not in your outline. These are for free. What you value the most will control your life. Jesus is offering a summary statement to those who maybe think they do the religious thing, but their hearts are still empty. They're still missing Jesus. What do you actually value the most? I think it's a worthwhile question, and Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is also. I almost made this point about, oh, something about, Look at your checkbook. <laughs> it, it says a lot about you. Look at your schedule. It says a lot about you. What do you value the most? 
Well, what you value the most will control your life. And then, can I say this really harshly? I did some reading around this chapter this week from some authors that I hadn't read before, and, and this theme kept coming up for me. Worry is a symptom of idolatry. And, and again, wow, is that hard to swallow? I think so. <laughs> it's really hard to swallow. But Lord, I want you, your spirit, to diagnose my heart. I don't want to I don't want to just hear everything's okay if everything's not okay. And Jesus loves people enough to do that. And and he did it on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's part of what made him so unpopular. He told the truth. (laughs) We often don't want the truth. What if? Maybe I should have put it that way for you. But what if worry is a symptom that I'm valuing something more than Jesus? This is not to minimize the weights that you and I carry. Every person here has burdens. Every person here has struggles and worries and unknowns and pains. And I think what Jesus is inviting us to do is to Take those things and bring them to his feet. Do you have lots to think about right now? (laughs) Lots to worry about even? (laughs) You know, corporately as a church family, we're in transition, aren't we? I think all churches are feeling it. It's hard to name it exactly, but we're all feeling it. This whole thing about in-person worship and online worship. If you are in person here, um, I'm going to invite you to hear more in my pastor's report. But suffice it to say, any uncertainty brings anxiety. We've all got it. Some of you know that Kirk York is recovering from a surgery. I'm not minimizing anybody's burden. I had an abdominal kind of a surgery that was much more minor than what he had. And man, was I on my back. Did you know that Dennis McClure had to have more surgery? He had a limb amputated not long ago, but is dealing with infection, and so now he's on a pick line. Anything that I mention here isn't just hard for the patient, it's hard for the loved ones. What, What are the things that are heavy for us. I learned that uh, Elvin Clarkson is showing more health symptoms that are not good. There are others among us with medical tests that are pending or biopsies and they're waiting for results. There are many among us who are processing grief and loss and big change in their life. For others, their work life is very unsecure. There's, there's all kinds of things I think of Steve Richardson in recovery. Thinking about the fact that school's around the corner. This is a really hard year for people working in the school system. Students, teachers, staff. And the list goes on, doesn't it? I not only uh, visited Cairo, Egypt, the year that I went there, I also visited Jerusalem. And there are two traditional sites where Jesus was, his remains were committed. And I was thinking about the contrast between how they buried King Tut and how Jesus was buried. Sometimes we don't have all of the worldly things going for us that we worry about and we wish were going on. But I actually saw King Tut's remains. And if you go there, you have to pay an extra 10 euro or something and you can tour through this, no cameras. He doesn't look good. 
<laughs> and you can also go to the garden tomb in Jerusalem or the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And Jesus is not visible there. He was laid in a borrowed tomb, rejected, one who suffered capital punishment. I mean, talk about the circumstances of this world being so polar opposite. But Jesus isn't there. And I think fundamentally we can put our hope in the temporary things that seem so appealing and we would think will deliver or we can put our hope in a crucified Savior who has risen. At the end of the day, he wins. I want to invite you with me to enter a moment of open worship. And if you will, even as a symbolic act, if you've got something in your hand just to set it aside, and if it's helpful to you, just close your eyes. As I've invited you to think about our burdens and our worries and putting God first above all these other things that are going to compete for our allegiance, hear these words from Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air sometimes you go about your Sabbath rest day. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than all they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that, is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own.